delighted to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, today we're going to be talking about um, the quest for extraterrestrial life. Now, most people think of extraterrestrial life in terms of the Fermi paradox. That is to say, this happened years ago. The very uh, renowned physicist Enrico Fermi uh, was sitting and talking with a group of people over lunch about um, you know, extraterrestrial civilizations. And um, he suddenly stopped the conversation and said, where are they? And since that time, SETI, and many of you have probably heard of SETI, SETI is the uh, Institute for um, Investigating Extraterrestrial Intelligent Life, has asked that question, where are they? If they're a universe teeming in a galaxy, teeming in extraterrestrial civilizations, where are they? Well, there have been t lots and lots of uh, explanations before about where they are. Intelligent life destroys itself. That's one, particularly given my esteemed president's recent decisions, I think is highly likely. Um, but there are a lot of others, including intelligent civilizations are too far apart in space and time. Humans are not listening properly. But the bottom one in red is the one that really concerns me and many astrobiologists, that large, complex life, we have reason to believe Organisms like us, plants and animals, even jellyfish, I consider large, complex organisms, are extremely rare in the universe. There's evidence that the vast majority of life is microbial. If you look at this little map of the history of life on Earth and you follow it around, you will see something really remarkable. Complex multicellular, that is having more than one cell with differentiated tissues and organs such as we have and jellyfish have, is actually fairly recent on Earth. Life, the planet Earth, is 4.5 billion years old. And there's new evidence in the last couple of months that life goes back to 4.1 million years ago. So very shortly after the formation of Earth, we have evidence of life. But it is bacteria-like life, single-celled organisms. And we see evidence of single-celled bacteria-like life all the way down until around 700 million years ago, uh, when suddenly um, we have the first evidence of complex multicellular life. And I'm talking about things like jellyfish. I'm not talking about intelligent life. So why did it take more than three billion years on Earth to produce complex multicellular organisms? That's a great mystery. But my focus, and the focus of almost all astrobiologists, is on Simple life, bacterial life, that's what we're hoping to find. We think the vast majority of life in the universe is uh, that of bacteria. Focus of most astrobiologists is in finding microbial or microscopic extraterrestrial life. That's clearly more difficult than finding some you know, large green creatures wandering around on Mars, which we're going to talk a little later about the Viking landers. They actually had a camera just in case. This is in the 1970s, but nobody really expected to find them. So we're looking for microscopic life. We want to know whether microscopic life is fairly common in the universe or it itself is rare. Given that you know Earth seems to have it at 14.1 billion years, we think it's probably fairly common. Now there are three strategies for searching for microscopic life. The most popular one is to define life. That's one of the ones that NASA uh, is most uh, favorable uh, towards. And you see lots and lots of definitions of life. The other is using a universal theory of life. The basic idea is we have universal principles of life, like, we, like in Newtonian physics. We have universal principles of physics. You know the initial conditions, uh, the force is acting, you can, uh, and the time at which it occurs, you can track where a cannonball will land. Well, you could hope for the same thing if you had a universal theory of life. We could say, well, you know on Venus, where you have a very enriched carbon dioxide atmosphere that's extremely dense and hot, uh, you could feed those universal principles and say whether or not it's likely to have life on uh, Venus or Mars, where you have a carbon dioxide atmosphere, but it's very thin and uh, cold. So you'd think that one of these two methods would work, but it turns out, and I'm going to talk about this very briefly, that both of them are really a problem in searching for extraterrestrial life. And my proposal, which I've been arguing with NASA for more than 15 years, is searching for anomalies, and I'll explain what that means. And I've convinced some people, and I'm hoping to convince more 
as time goes on. So the problem with definitions, I'm just going to go through this very quickly because we don't have a lot of time. The problem with definitions, they're the kind of thing that you find in dictionaries. They're not very good in dictionaries because they're usually circular. So logicians, among them philosophers, have really studied the logic of definition. And the most important thing for our purposes is that they're about meaning and concepts. Not about what's out there, but what pieces of language mean. So you find bachelor as being the classic example. So you see people uh, giving in logic courses, you know, bachelor, and they define it as unmarried human male. Now, if you think about this, if somebody says to you, oh, I don't think bachelors are unmarried human males, you would say, well, you just don't understand the English, in this case, language. You wouldn't send out somebody, uh, a social scientist, to ask bachelors, are you unmarried? Are you male? Because it's just a matter of understanding the language. Um, in contrast, if you want to know whether bachelors are unhappy, you would send out a social scientist to talk to bachelors and say, are you a bachelor? Are you unhappy? Uh, or are you happy? That's a reasonable scientific project, but not to define bachelor. And that becomes a real problem. And I think we can see it by trying to imagine ourselves back into the 17th century or the 16th century in the case I'm going to look at and a similar case of trying to define water. So here's Leonardo da Vinci, who had a lifetime interest in water. And you can see his deep puzzlement. If you look at the water, is sometimes sharp, sometimes strong, sometimes acid. He doesn't know what to make of it. He's fascinated by water, but he doesn't know what water is. And if he were trying to define it, he would define it in terms of its sensible properties. So water, for Leonardo da Vinci, there's you know, muddy water. What makes muddy water the same as brackish water? Uh, so there are all these different kinds of waters, and he's wondering, what does water have in common? And what's really interesting here is the alchemists, the early um, chemists, chose solvency. They thought that was the essential property of water. And they classified uh, nitric acid and, mix and mixtures of hydrochloric acid, which are even better solvents than water, as water, and they gave them the name Agua Fortis and Agua Regia. It's not an accident that they called them Agua. They thought they were waters, strong waters, uh, because they were even better acids, what we now call water. But we now know they're wrong, because these chemical substances have different molecular compounds. Water is H2O, nitric acid is NHNO3. No amount of analysis of the phenomenal properties of water familiar to a 17th century chemist could reveal that water is H2O. And there's an important lesson here. It's like the case of Bachelor. You cannot discover what a term refers to in the natural world by analyzing your concept of it. And astrobiologists don't want to investigate our concept of life. They want to know what it really is. And that's something that a definition can't tell you. So maybe we should go to theories. A biological theory could act like Newton's theory, and we could use principles and initial conditions to deduce where best to look for water, I mean, for life, whether on uh, Venus or Mars. And there's an enormous problem, and I don't have time to go through this, so I'm going to say very quickly what the problem is. The problem is that we now know that all life on Earth, from the simplest bacterium to a jellyfish to a redwood tree to a human being, all share a last universal common ancestor. There are segments of their sequences in their genomes that are in common. We know that the more closely related you, uh, organisms are, the more of these sequences they share in common. And there's really no reasonable explanation for this, except that we all descended from a last universal common ancestor, some sort of microbe, single cell-like thing, 4.1 or 4.2 billion years ago. The morphological diversity of life, from jellyfish to you know, birds to insects, to kind of disguises, because you might think, boy, look at all this variety of life. Surely all the possibilities are, are realized here. But that disguises this incredible similarity, both at the genomic level and at the molecular level. All life on Earth uses the same 20 amino acids. And there are over 100 amino acids it could use. Protein chemists have actually created in the laboratory uh, different proteins, proteins that no form of life uses on Earth that use a different sequence of amino acids. And the same can be said for the nucleic acids that store our hereditary information. 
So this is the big N equals 1 problem that all astrobiologists worry about, which is how can you generalize to all life from what you know is a single, possibly unrepresentative sample of life? That is the challenge. And this is the dilemma. How can we recognize unfamiliar forms of microscopic life with a different molecular basis, maybe silicon-based life? or maybe carbon-based life that doesn't use exactly the same sequence of amino acids and the same nucleic acid bases. If we don't have a definition or universal theory of life. This is what always they throw in your face if you say, look, we can't have a definition and we can't have a general theory because we just don't know enough. And the answer I give is that, well, if you're going to go with a definition or a general theory as your basis, you're going to not see life that's very different from our form of life you're going to miss the most interesting kinds of life that are out there. You're going to only recognize it if it's like our form of life. So my solution is to use tentative versus defining criteria to search for anomalies. What are anomalies? Anomalies are physical systems that both resemble and fail to resemble life as we know it in provocative and unanticipated ways. They have certain features that are like our form of life, but others that we associate with non-living systems. So rather than looking for familiar life and thumbs up, it's alive, or thumbs down, mostly it's going to be thumbs down if it's very different from our form of life, I suggest we look for those weird systems that we can't easily classify as living or non-living. They have features that we associate with life on Earth, but they also have features that we don't. And once you identify such a system, it becomes a focus for further astrobiological investigations, both empirical and theoretical, and this contrasts with the definitional approach, which identifies the cases that don't conform to our form of life uh, as non-living, period. And once you identify an anomalous physical system, it becomes a focus for further research. You become really interested in exploring it further. This contrasts, again, with the definitional approach, which identifies cases that don't conform to the favored definition as non-living, period. And now the fun part, a case study. The famous Viking mission to Mars in the mid-1970s. They found something weird. They found something anomalous. And I'm going to tell you about that now. And this is a classic example of how going with the definition has basically blinded astrobiologists to a system that should have been further explored. The Viking biology lander experiments, there were three metabolic experiments based on a metabolic uh, definition of life that was very closely based on Earth life. It was a, they had a labeled nutrient solution, basically uh, carbohydrates that would be able to be metabolized by most earth organisms that were cultivatable. Turns out they didn't know then, but uh, less than 1% of earth organisms can be cultivated. So that was pretty bizarre to go with that. Nobody would ever do that now. But that's what they did then because they thought metabolism was important and they thought, gee, metabolism on Mars is going to be like metabolism on Earth. Extremely unlikely, everybody agrees now all initially showed positive results. They had champagne in the refrigerator, and they were halfway to the refrigerator to get that champagne. Two of them were initially explained, but the labeled release experiment to this day remains very puzzling. And the gas chromatographs mass spectrometer found no organic, that is carbon molecules, and that killed the explanation. They now say, they explain the uh, results of the labeled release experiment in terms of mysterious Martian oxidant, and everybody thinks, oh, that's why Mars is red. But of course, that's not the, the mysterious oxidant that now they think is responsible for that. They uh, first thought hydrogen peroxide, then they thought weird states of iron and perchlorate are now hypothesized, but none of these work. It turns out that laboratory researchers say none of them can explain the mysterious results on Mars. So did the Viking experiments find Martian microbes? NASA concluded no. No organic compounds were found, and the LR response on Mars was too much too soon. It was faster than what you find on Earth. Really bizarre to be that picky. A second injection of nutrients into positive soil samples not only failed to reinvigorate the evolution of the CO2 gas, which normally happens with earth microbes, but um, some of the gas was reabsorbed. Nobody knew what to say about this. Uh, the PIs, the principal investigators at the LR experiment, Levin and Strat, concluded yes. They were, really, they were really angry with NASA. They claimed that NASA gave them a definition 
a chemical metabolic definition, and the results of their experiment satisfied it, which it did technically because NASA had not anticipated the anomalous results. NASA has never gone back to Mars to actually identify the mysterious oxidant because their mission was to find life, and they concluded they didn't find it, and they concluded this on the basis of a debate over a definition. How ridiculous. Uh, so that's um, the end. Thank you. There was one key question that we had. Why is there this? I mean, what is behind, you know, because you, you talked about the fact that people are looking for this extraterrestrial life, like, the, you know, people like us, you know, yeah. that's what we're looking for. But, you know, there's this search for microbe life. But why? So I, I can say there are two reasons. One is, this is the reason NASA wants to go, we lack a universal theory of life. We do not know how unrepresented our unrepresentative of life our solitary uh, example of life here on Earth is. Despite, you know, bacteria, you, me, get redwood trees, we're all a single example of life. So if we really want to have a universal general understanding of life, we need to go to Mars or we need to go to, um, you know, someplace like um, Venus uh, or perhaps here on Earth. I invented the term shadow biosphere. I can't go into that. But uh, shadow biosphere, there may be organisms on Earth descended from a different origin that we can't detect because our methods are so Earth-centric. They're based uh, on, I mean, by Earth-centric, I mean they're based on our form of life. So we want to know, what are the possibilities for life? The other reason is, of course, if you're going to find intelligent extraterrestrial life, the first thing you've got to find is life. And that's... So ultimately there is that desire to yeah. find Oh yeah, we would love to find an extraterrestrial civilization. But if microbial life is extraordinarily rare, if it's really, you know, this planet is a very lucky and rare planet, or unlucky, depending on your perspective on life right now, again, <laughs> being a, uh, an Amer U.S. citizen, um, I'm pretty cynical about certain forms of life in the White House. <laughs> but all that aside, um, I think that's the, that's the reason. Carol Cleland, thanks very much. Thank you.